this is a panel on, on fat protocols. And while I could introduce everyone, I think it's always better if they get to do it uh, themselves. So I'll start uh, basically with, the, I think, the most obvious first question. Uh, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, my name is Eric Meltzer. Uh, I'm a partner at in Blockchain, so we're China's largest crypto fund, and I focus on early stage investments for the fund. Hi, my name is Jill Carlson. Um, I'm an independent consultant in crypto, which apparently is a thing you can do in 2018. Uh, I work with everyone ranging from large financial institutions all the way down to what I think are the more interesting projects, which are small protocol projects getting off the ground. Hi, I'm Nick Carter. I uh, work for Fidelity on the venture side of the house. Um, I'm a crypto asset analyst, and uh, we focus on um, equity investments in companies building on these protocols. So just to make sure we're all having a conversation about the same things, I'm going to ask another rather basic question. What is, what is a FAT protocol? Let's have our definition, uh, get our definition straight up front here. Nick, you want to for anyone who feels they can... So I was just rereading the the uh, seminal paper, and I was about, the, the one thing I was committed to saying was let's define the thing first, right? Um, so I, I think there are kind of two disparate claims there, right? Um, one is that there's a shared, a pooled set of data that um, applications can freely borrow from and it'll make it much easier to build on top of these things. And then the other claim is that, you know, it'll become much easier to um, build these because you could embed some sort of value into the protocol and monetize it very simply. So it's like a new incentive mechanism, right? Do you guys agree? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. I will also reference, there's a good blog post by Union Square Ventures. It's probably, I don't know if they get credit for coining the term fat protocol or not, but if you if you Google USB fat protocol, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, did you... Oh, no, no, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that is the definition. Uh, I think what's funny about this panel is that none of us really buy the FAT protocol hypothesis, and so... Don't give it away. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Jill does. You, no? no? Yeah, so... I, I think it's worth um, making the parallel as, as the seminal blog post uh, does to the internet. Um, so for those of you who aren't as familiar with this theory or uh, concept of FAT protocols, the idea is that in the internet boom, it wasn't really the protocols underlying the technology uh, that benefited or accrued value in the web taking off. It was the application layers that were fat or value rich. So, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons that were all built on top of TCP IP and HTTPS, et cetera, that benefited and accrued value in the form of, you know, shareholder value, stocks going up, et cetera. There is no real way to invest in or gain access to benefit at sort of the TCP IP layer, for example. The idea is that with blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, that's going to be inverted. That at the protocol layer, we're going to accrue all of the value to these protocol tokens, a la Ethereum, and that the applications will be thin or not accrue the value. Um, so that's, I guess, what this conversation is kind of going to be about. And I think it's worth also mentioning that something that we're seeing emerge is actually just multiple layers. And so, you know, maybe thinking about it not just in terms of those two layers, but of the other layers and features and pieces of infrastructure uh, that can get added onto these, it's worth thinking about as well. So two of the people on this panel are coming at it from the investment side. So I guess one of the questions I would have for both of you, uh, Nick and Eric, What's, what's your investment thesis around FAT protocols? How do you guys look at these things? Yeah, I mean, so I think in blockchain is fairly unique within the space in that we like aggressively have no thesis whatsoever <laughs> about anything. Um, <laughs> we, think, we think the space is still way too early for that. And frankly, like I just get really sick of reading these like 50,000 word think pieces uh, with a bunch of speculation about how we should be thinking about these assets. Um, so I think for us, like we're very opportunistic. We just look for strong teams building something that people actually want. Um, and I think being constrained by like, oh, we only invest at this level of the protocol or whatever would be really damaging for an investment fund. Nick? So from our view, um, we've obviously been thinking a lot about this recently, and I think since the blog post was written, we have some new evidence um, as to the, the truth or falsity of the claim, essentially. Um, you know, some new things have come to light, essentially. Um, and 
Um, the, the more I think about it, the more I think that the protocols that really ultimately succeed will be the most open and fairly distributed ones uh, without any sort of extractive mechanisms layered on top or run seeking. Um, so I'm kind of skeptical of the notion that a team can allocate themselves, you know, like a huge percentage of some like quote unquote, you know, re universal protocol that they distribute to the world and then monetize it that way. Um, and uh, you know, like allow for productive investment. I, I just I think it's kind of a paradox. Yeah, no, this I think that's super astute. That when we see projects and they come to us and they say, you know, we're building the future of the internet infrastructure, and then they say, at our team allotment is twenty percent. <laughs> it's like, like yeah, like like the internet ever would have taken off if someone could just extract a twenty percent rent on like every single IP. On the underlying protocol. On, on the underlying okay. protocol. Like that's just, to us it's on face ridiculous. And so if, if some team came to us and said, you know, our team stake is 0.01%, then like I might believe that ambition. Um, but so far no one's doing that. But Eric, it's decentralized. Oh, but it's decentralized, of course. Well, in that case, where, where do I sign the check? <laughs> so let me, let me try asking the question a little, maybe this is the same question, maybe it's a different question, and I'll ask, I'll ask Jill first. When, when is a FAT protocol necessary? Like am I gonna have a FAT protocol for everything that I do, or they're gonna, you know, when, when, so we're gonna fat protocolize everything or just some things? So look, I think everything is, every application that we see built, leveraging some form of applied cryptography, blockchain systems, will have an underlying protocol, whether that's Ethereum or, you know, one of the new ones that are coming out. Um, more recently that we're just starting to see applications be built on. Everything needs an underlying protocol. A protocol is just the set of rules by which the players on the system must abide, right? Whether or not those protocols are fat, meaning whether or not those protocols are what accrues value, so, you know, as an investor, whether that's the area that I want exposure to, I think is a completely separate question. Um, the way that I tend to think about all of this being broken down into layers, as I mentioned earlier, is at the bottom you have the protocol layer of, again, just sort of the base set of rules by which the players on the system must abide. As kind of a middleware layer, almost, you have a platform, right? And so this is probably most evident in Ethereum today where you have all of these developer tools and uh, smart contracting languages. And using that platform, developers can go in and build products on top of that, right? So you have the protocol, you have the platform, and then you have the actual end user products or applications. Now where this becomes a little bit confusing or circular, I think, is you can have a protocol and a product without it necessarily being a platform. And I would argue that until at least very recently, that's what Bitcoin was, where you had an underlying protocol you also had a product, a fundamentally a payments product or a store of value product, an end user application. And until, say, Rootstock and a couple of the other kind of smart contracty projects that have taken off on Bitcoin recently, there was no real platform layer. Now, people love to point to Bitcoin as the classic example of, look, it's this protocol and it's accrued all of this value, therefore we have fat protocols. I would argue instead that Bitcoin has accrued value because of it as a product, not as a protocol, as a payments application, as a store of value. Yeah, so I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin might be the only protocol I think kind of is a fat protocol. And I guess the reason that, that I mean, you, you, what you want to think about is from the incentives of someone building on one of these platforms, why would you agree to allow value to accrue to someone else? And I think Bitcoin is one of the only protocols that, that gives a real incentive, which is just Bitcoin provides extreme security. So Bitcoin transactions are way more immutable than other network transactions. And so like you see, I mean guys like I think Blockstack have an interesting implementation where to register a domain name on the blocks, I think it's called BNS, it's like their version of DNS. And to register a name there, you have to burn Bitcoin. Um, and so these, these domains are then burned into the Bitcoin blockchain forever. Um, and in that case, it's something like, you know, for your DNS system, you need to have a very high degree of security. And so it makes sense for them to allow that value to accrue to Bitcoin. Um, because they're actually getting something out of it. And I think most of the time you don't really see those incentives. So that was, that was a, a, a rather provocative statement that you made, so I want to I dig in a little bit. If, if I pull up, uh, let's say, uh, the coin, coin market cap and I look at all of these coins, none of these are, are, are fat protocols in your opinion? <sighs> <laughs> it's a, it's a tough I mean, you know, if Ethereum is the one that everyone wants to think of as a, as a fat protocol. I think in reality, most tokens have a much more complicated interaction with the underlying Ethereum blockchain than, than that. And if you look really like, 
they, you know, when you're, when you're doing ERC-20 tokens, there's some usage that's happening of the Ethereum blockchain. So like there, there's some value accreted there, but it's very, very little compared to sort of what the, the thesis would demand. Nick? I can back Eric up on that, I think. Um, you can kind of think of it through like a portfolio allocation perspective, right? So I think that one of the fundamental questions is why would anyone want to hold this token, right? So in Bitcoin, it's very simple, but it's a very special case, right? Because usage is tantamount to holding, right? Um, this is the, basically a store value hypothesis. Holding Bitcoin grants benefits to the users that they can't get through holding other assets, right? But in other protocols, um, competitors, tokens, crypto assets, um, they're meant to be used transactionally, right? They're not meant to be held necessarily, or maybe you know the orchestrators of those protocols, um, you know, create like a staking mechanism to sort of like induce users to hold, right? But fundamentally, Bitcoin it tries to be an alternative form of money, right? It's not trying to be a smart contracting platform or anything like that. So usage in that particular case of the money token is tantamount to holding. So that's how value can sort of successfully accrue to the base layer, right? But in virtually everything else on the market out there, you know, aside from the money tokens, um, that's not the case, right? They're meant to be used transactionally, so no one is induced, no one, you know, has a strong incentive to, to hold these things for, you know, a non-zero period of time unless they're using it, right? And if they become more efficient and, you know, they, you know, succeed with scaling, then I don't see why anyone would hold them for, you know, a, a meaningful period of time, right? So this is basically my view. Um, I think Bitcoin is, is a particularly unique case because it tries to function as an alternative form of money, a sound savings mechanism. Uh, and many of its sort of many of the things we're lumping together in the same group. I think we, we probably need to be a little bit more rigorous with our taxonomy there um, and differentiate them a little bit because they're not you know they're not even the same kind of thing. I, I would just build on that. Um, you know, Nick refers to these sort of money tokens or money cryptocurrencies that are fundamentally just intended to be used as store of value or payments, um, possibly even unit of account. Well, that's a bit different. Um, I think that there's a world in which Ethereum could have or even still could become a FAT protocol and accrue value at the Ethereum token layer uh, based on the applications that get built on it. And that would be a world in which, say, Filecoin, for example, instead of issuing, creating Filecoins to be used within the system, leveraged ETH. That, for whatever reason, I think in part, possibly because of this FAT protocol theory that has sort of propagated itself throughout the market, has tended to make for very compelling pitch decks and white papers to investors has not been the case, right? We've ended up instead with the Cambrian explosion of tokens on the Ethereum platform and probably yet to emerge on other smart contracting uh, protocol platform plays. And, and that's kind of what's, I think, in a way holding us back from seeing the emergence of truly fat protocols, if you will. So some good answers here that segue nicely into my, ne my next question, which was about uh, blockchain economics. And I'm going to have sort of two sub-questions here. So the first is about the economics of, of blockchains generally. Uh, if I'm feeling trollish and someone asks me what a blockchain is, I say it's the world's shittiest database technology. Um, right now we're spending about a million dollars a day. Uh, we uh, are spending about a million dollars a day to maintain the, the Bitcoin blockchain. That's the amount of real world resources that are being used to, to maintain it. Is part of the thesis here that is it that we're going to either make these technologies more efficient, that is, we will reduce the costs necessary to maintain them, or that even with these costs, there are other efficiency gains so that it's still a, 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 net, a net gain despite the costs? I mean, I think a million dollars a day is incredibly cheap for what Bitcoin gives us. Um, so at, at a million bucks, like, I'm happy, that's fine. If we can make it cheaper, that's great. Uh, I think like Nick Szabo has a, has a great piece on this about social trust and, and, and that you know, decreasing the amount of trust in the world is actually a really valuable thing to do. Um, I think if you look at the amount of infrastructure something like Bitcoin can eventually replace, a million bucks continues to look cheap. Um, and I think it's going to end up costing a lot more than that. As, you know, as the amount of value that this thing is protecting goes up, then the cost to run it will also approach that, that amount of value. 
Yeah, I think I'd like to gently push back on that. Um, I mean, I haven't looked at the data recently, but um, the the daily cost of Bitcoin is just the inflation, right? The dollar value of inflation. And um, I think it's something like 1,800 coins are minted a day. Um, so I think it's a little bit more than a million dollars. Um, and then secondly, it's odd to uh, to to sort of think of that solely as a cost because it's also the security benefit of the system, right? Because it's the cost to attack it as well. So that is, you know, the reason that we believe that the system is credible and honest is because, you know, it's fairly expensive. You know, it might cost you $500 million to get sufficient ASICs to attack the system and then, you know, a little bit more in electricity too. So the, you know, it's both a cost and a benefit. It's two sides of the same coin. Jill, anything? Yeah, I, I would agree with Nick on that, is that, you know, people love to talk about the cost of proof of work, even the cost of some of the other consensus protocols we're seeing being worked on. But exactly, I mean, if what you're looking for is database technology that's going to be cost effective or really effective, period, uh, probably a blockchain is not going to be your solution. If you're looking for a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that's going to be tamper-resistant, then it's the only option, at which point, you know, a million dollars a day is, is cheap. I mean, I think we can empirically verify but that, like, the fact that miners are out there mining this thing means it is that valuable. Like, that's, there's not, I don't think there needs to really be any debate on that anymore. The shared illusion of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so let's, let's, let's talk economics a little bit more, but in a, in a different direction. Um, one of the ideas of these FAT protocols is, the more successful my protocol is, the larger the economy will be, therefore the token will be worth more money. Now, I'm not uh, an economist, so I may be uh, say, I'm possibly straying from my area of expertise here, but as I understand it, if we double the size uh, of an economy, uh, all things held the same, we should expect the value of a token to increase less than double. That is, we should see sub sublinear growth uh, in, in comparison with the size of the market. Uh, how do you think that plays out with some of this, this thesis around the value of the coins? Is this something that's well understood? Well, one, is this true in your opinion? And then, and two, if it is true, is it well understood? I think most of this is just completely obscured by speculation. So that like, if you're, if you're a classical economist and you're trying to model supply and demand, you're just going to get wrecked. I mean, because <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not what's driving the value mostly. I would actually back up the question even to the macro level. So something I've been thinking about a lot lately is what does this all look like in a very macro context of like the global economy? And what I've been thinking about is, okay, over the last 10 years, we've been in one of the biggest bull market runs in every asset class that we've seen, right? Going back to starting in 2009. We've also been in the biggest run ever of quantitative easing of central banks just pumping money into these economies. In most economies, that looks like it's not gonna slow down anytime soon. And what that's resulted in is a massive search for yield by investors. And that's driven money into riskier and riskier asset classes. Emerging markets are at all time highs. Um, that has driven more and more money into venture capital, standard venture capital funding of startups. And I almost tend to think of the ICO boom as sort of the logical conclusion of all of this, right? You know, of investors globally, whether that's retail, you know, mom and pop, all the way up to big institutions like Fidelity, looking for just the riskiest assets that they can get their hands on where do you go next, but this sort of very emerging asset class. So that's, that's zooming really way out here, but I think that it's important. It's so easy for all of us, especially I know a lot of people in this room and watching are probably sort of very technology focused. It's very easy to get very sucked into like the white papers and you know sort of the transformation that's happening on the micro level, but to zoom out and look at it in context is very important. I think it's an extremely good point. For the record, we don't buy ICOs. <laughs> um, to, to I can see my Bitcoin balance on the Fidelity page, though, so that's pretty cool. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> so to return to the question um, from the economic perspective, I think it's an extremely good question. And if you can answer it well, you can probably um, outperform, right? So um, just to restate it, I think the, the question is if these the sort of... Um, aggregate economic activity on a protocol increases, you're saying, does that transfer to the token value, right? And, and to what degree? 
Yeah, so um, I, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the notion of the velocity problem. You're probably familiar exactly. too. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's extremely salient and um, I think highly relevant. Um, so right now all these things are super inefficient, so people can't really use them as much as they'd like to, right? And so that's sort of a, that's a natural uh, inhibitor on the amount of turnover that's possible in the system. Um, but you know, in theory, if you know you could layer on a, a, a layer two mechanism on uh, Ethereum or something, and it, like increase the turnover and the velocity, then I think you know we'd begin to see some of these effects, um, whereby uh, as the velocity increases, you might imagine that that might have like a price suppressing um, effect. So. I think ultimately these things aren't mature enough to see the manifestation of the velocity problem, but my guess would be it would it would have a really like suppressing impact. So, you know, to clarify, I think we have to break the linkage between the volume of economic activity on a system and the, the value of, of an, an individual unit in that system. What, what do you mean by break the linkage? I don't think there is a strong connection, essentially. So, but, so ben, I think one thing that you can do there is you can design other classes of tokens that can accrue value based on network usage. Um, and so far, there really aren't that many of them. I guess one that I would give a big shout out to is, is the SIA team has a very little known token called SIA Fund. Um, and so they have this, SIA coin is what you use to access the network. They have this other token called SIA Fund. There's 10,000 of them, they're not divisible. Um, they trade on an extremely illiquid market for like 10 grand a piece, and maybe one goes up for sale a day. So they're kind of hard to get your hands on. What's cool about them is that they, they essentially extract a 3% rent from the SIA network. And so as SIA usage goes up, the value of that will very linearly track, track usage. And I think tokens like that are probably the future. Like you really don't want your network token to be fluctuating. There's just like that's a hassle on every level and it's, it's just clearly not good. And so I think we'll probably see a lot more SIA fund, we'll see like more SIA fund style tokens. The, the issue with those is that they're transparently securities. And so like SIA is just biting that bullet and selling it as a, as a registered security. Um, but you know, that's, that's tricky. And I guess the last panel had some, had some thoughts about that, so we'll see how that evolves going forward. So you guys are good at giving answers that segue nicely into my next questions. So as I wanted to, I wanted to hear about, uh, in your, your guys' opinion, what are some of the most successful FAT protocols out there? What are some of the ones that are the most promising? What are we, what are we excited about? I think we're all like Bitcoin maximalists here. <laughs> Don't help me. <laughs> you're, all, you're all Bitcoin maximalists? A little bit. <laughs> no, look, so I think, I'll, I'll take this. I think that there are some really interesting, exciting platform plays coming. I mean, I, look, I'm a big believer in Bitcoin, as Eric said. I'm also, you know, one of the main reasons why I got into this space was because of a lot of the thinking around how much more you can do then with digital and programmable money. Um, and... I, I'm a little hesitant to take on the question of like which FAT protocols am I most excited about because that almost feels like speculation about like, oh, these protocols are going to become FAT or, you know, value accruing. But I'm mostly excited about some of the, you know, new technology plays coming out here. Uh, and I think of that as just infrastructure for this wider world of, of blockchain tech. So I'm excited to see some of the uh, more... Uh, scalable versions of Ethereum that are coming out. So things like Algorand, for example. Um, I'm excited to see what happens with some of the more interesting governance plays that are happening in the space. I would put Tezos in that category. Um, I would put ZeroX in that category. Uh, I'm excited about decentralized exchange. So I, I used to be a trader on Wall Street. And one of the really exciting things to me when I first started reading about Bitcoin back several years ago, when I was still sitting on the trading desk, was I was working this kind of soul-sucking job, right? If you're sitting there as literally a middleman, just taking bonds in my left hand, clipping a spread, and then passing them off to someone else in my right hand. And it was this idea of like, oh, here's this peer-to-peer -peer system for transferring value. Well, it turns out Bitcoin can't really help you with that problem of, of actual exchange, right? Which was what any trader is facilitating in that seat. But some of the projects coming out in that space, um, ZeroX specifically, I think is the most compelling, uh, are really exciting to me because that adds a layer of functionality to the whole systems. I'm gonna, so I wanna, I wanna dig in this a little bit, uh, a little bit more, right? Because we're talking about 
uh, billions of dollars being invested in these blockchains and these technologies. And, you know, I'm basically asking the question like, okay, so which ones of these can I go use? Can I go touch? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting an answer. It's, well, I'm excited about the ones that let you trade tokens for other tokens, right? So where, where are the ones that are... It's know, tokens all the way down. <laughs> right, right. That's what it feels like sometimes. Um, so, I mean, so what's, what's holding this back then? Let me, maybe I'll ask it this way. Why aren't we starting to talk about, oh, you should use AppX or Technology Y uh, instead of using the centralized solution? What's, what's, stopping, uh, what's stopping us from getting the real-world traction, the users, this kind of thing? So I, I would push back on the idea that we don't have real world traction. I think in the US it looks that way because in the US we have a high trust society that functions with trusted institutions. Um, I think you are seeing adoption in places that don't have that, you know, mostly of Bitcoin, but then also beginning to have some other things happening. I think like privacy coins, like if, if you forced me to have a thesis, I would probably say like, you know, privacy coins are good. <laughs> there's like, there's gonna be a lot of demand for that, especially in a world where, you know, panoptic surveillance is just getting more and more common. Um, and I think like the tokens all the way down thing shouldn't bother people as much as it does, just because like those that infrastructure is necessary to do anything else. So like zero X, like it could look like a speculation platform, or it could just look like the interchange layer for any DApp. Like any DApp that has a bunch of tokens, you need some way to quickly convert between them. That's what zero X is building. If their first use case is trading tokens, that's fine with me. But so I, I guess I mean the one if if, we're, if there's this idea, this thesis that a, a bunch of centralized protocols, a bunch of centralized solutions are going to become decentralized fat protocol based solutions. All the ones we're pointing to are just new forms of money. Where's where are the fat protocols that are going to do things that aren't just that? Like what? I th I think that's what it's all about, though. I don't know why we. I, I think that it is all about new forms of money and what you can do with those new forms of money, and. Of course, if you're creating a new form of money, speculation is going to be the first use case, which I will be the first to say. Speculation is not in and of itself a use case, right? But there are all other different kinds of things that we use money for and ways that we deploy it in real life that we just don't yet have the infrastructure for yet. So something I've been thinking about is if we look at money in sort of the real world, if you will, in sort of normal everyday life, it's all dependent on credit. Yes, we have cash, but in general, basically the way that the financial system runs is on credit. Now, Bitcoin, crypto in general, is all about solving the double spend problem, i.e. not being able to lever up. We don't have a concept of identity in this system, so it's impossible to extend credit from that perspective. Um, so I think that there are these very sort of fundamental building blocks that we're still missing in order to be able to expand upon the scope of what we can do with this new form of money. But personally, I think that's what it's all about. Yeah, but I think the definition of like what money, I mean, you can think of a lot of things that are like monetized now by a small group of people that probably should be monetized by everyone that's using them. And I think like just inter internet infrastructure is a good place to start. So you can think about like the IP space or even the DNS space. Like these are things that like, if you could turn that as sort of more liquid form of money and you could assign those rents to a larger group of people, that's probably gonna be a good thing. I think we'll see a lot of that over the next year. So it's not like, you get, when, you, when you think of like new money, I think you should think of it as like a pretty broad category of, of just exchangeable value. I think I have a kind of a different answer. Um, if, if the question is what's holding the industry back from you know, like fulfilling these dreams we have for it, I would say the, the primary issue would be the desire to sort of um, extract value from a system you're building. Um, if people were altruistic, we would have a much easier time of building things that were sustainable and distributed and that were solving real world problems. But instead, pretty much every team out there is trying to build something that is siloed and they want to be the base layer protocol for all these applications on top. They don't want to build on top of someone else's protocol because that gives them the value accrual, right? So it's this paradox whereby everybody wants to be the winner because we see the network, effect, network effects and the winner take all, and no one wants to help someone else's project succeed, right? So, and then, you know, pair that with the fact that, um, you know, founders and ICO underwriters expect 20% of all the tokens in a system, and it's just kind of unworkable. And if you I, I, think, I think that'll change, though. Like, I mean, you, you've been around for long enough that you remember, like, the days when taking 20, like, having a pre-mine was, like, a sin. Like, no one would touch your project. It's, it's pre-mined. We don't want that. And then now it's, like, now it's pretty standard. But I think maybe we'll have a, a backlash and we'll move back to the earlier days. 
Yeah, I, I think it's improving a little bit, and people are kind of remembering the open source principles that the industry is actually built on. Yep. Um, and you know, I just had a conversation with someone outside who's asking me, you know, how can I um, monetize my new protocol? And I told him, well, don't, you know, if you want it to succeed, just build it, okay? And you can monetize in other ways, you know? How did Linux developers monetize? They would consult, you know? Um, you know, they might form companies that were like sort of like related to what they were doing, but they didn't try and monetize the thing they were building itself, right? So we kind of have to break that idea that, you know, you can directly extract rent from the thing, you're, you're, the open source project you're building. Um, it, it just, it seems, it doesn't quite square with the ethos. Totally. And I, I think like, again, if you're, if you're building at scale, then like 0 0.01, 0.001 percent of that thing is extremely valuable. And so it's such a negative signal when we see a team allotting themselves these huge percentages because it's just like, I mean, think if you had 0.001 percent of Bitcoin, like that's, that's a lot of money. When you say that percentage, do you mean as a, as a pre-mine or as an ongoing usage fee? I like, well, I mean, I, th I think Zcash, Zcash's founder's reward model is the one that I find the least odious, where it's like they take a percentage in the beginning and then eventually it goes to zero. And so it's kind of like, a, it's not a pre-mine, it's not all up front, and then B, it's also not a permanent thing. So I think like as a funding mechanism, that's kind of like an okay way to do it if you really want to have that like kind of startup capital. Yeah, I mean, people are entering the space and even people who've been around the space for a while, we just don't have great frameworks yet for how to go about fundraising and frankly, how to go about getting rich off of it as a founder or an operator or a builder in this space without relying upon the sort of old school startup funding model, right? Where the founder keeps 20% of the equity for herself or himself and, you know, they sell off the rest of the company and they fundraise that way and then hopefully the company accrues value and everyone gets rich and lives happily ever after in Silicon Valley at the end. But if you look at... Bitcoin, and I would say that this above all is probably what attracts me to Bitcoin, why Eric would joke that I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, you look at what Satoshi did, right? And I think that part of the brilliance of Bitcoin is that Satoshi didn't have a pre-mine, right? He or her or they didn't try to get rich off of it, frankly. They weren't in it for fame or fortune or money. And I don't think that this is just some altruistic cypherpunk story, to be clear. I think that what happened was that Satoshi had this insight that in order to make this thing work, in order to have a real go-to-market strategy around it, he was going to have to launch it in a way that was truly decentralized, where there wasn't a figure behind it getting rich off of it. And I think that that is probably the most underrated revolution that Bitcoin offered. It wasn't just about, okay, he assembled this technology that was all pre-existing, by the way, I'm sure many of you at MIT know this. That was all around already. He assembled the technology in the new way. But maybe it wasn't writing the white paper that took him 10 years to figure out. Maybe it was how to solve all of the problems of actually bringing this thing to market in a sustainable way that would truly be trust minimized. And in order to do that, it had to be pseudonymous. And then he had to solve all of the OPSEC issues and where, where is he gonna put the white paper? You know, what, like, where do you, where do you airdrop this thing? What name should he use? Right. Um, how do you market this thing? I mean, Chancellor approved second bailout, right? That's masterstroke of marketing. Um, and, I think that projects like Mimble Wimble, for example, some of you might have seen Andrew Polstra talk about this yesterday. That's really appealing to me because it kind of follows in those same footsteps. Totally. I think like if, if you don't find the Satoshi story to be just one of the most like like fascinating, romantic, just amazing things, you're in the wrong space. Like it's just it's so <laughs> mind blowing. This guy like yeah, just just on the opsec level, like that's god tier opsec to be able to drop something like this, and we still don't know who this guy is. And I really, really hope he never shows up. Does that mean we're done, or are you just, no, just, just, just you're just showing the control you have over the crowd? Yeah, and you guys are showing how <laughs> how pliable you are. What the, he holds up a sign, and you all just clap. Jeez. Come on. Uh, so I am I am down to my last pre-written question, and I've received a total of zero suggested questions via Twitter. Thanks, guys. Uh, so if you wanna. If you, if I, we're gonna go with the microphone queuing system if I run out here. Uh, so I, my last one was, and um, uh, basically related to, you know, um, we've 
there's been a lot of uncertainty from the people uh, here who do this professionally about um, how is this stuff gonna um, how is this stuff gonna play out? How are these coins gonna make money? Will this stuff work? And at the same time, I was trying to go on, and it's very difficult to calculate uh, the what is what is the value of these platforms relative to their usage. One of the platforms that does do a good job uh, being public about this uh, is is Steam. So I in no way mean to call them out by using them as an example um, because I think they've they've got a real product and. And they're uh, they're growing it, but Steam had a, had a as a market cap of about four hundred million dollars. Uh, they have about sixty sixty thousand active users or sixty five thousand active users per day, um, and that means Steam's market cap is something like uh, over six thousand uh, dollars per user that's actually using the the platform. Um, this isn't really a question. This is just a statement of facts that I'm now going to let you uh, react to. And are, is, are we, are we, is this is this crazy? Is this sane? That's that's the, that's the question. How about that? I mean, I mean, it's it's the same thing. Like I, like I said before, it's just, this is all filtered through this lens of speculation. And so it's not that people think like Steemit users are worth six thousand dollars a pop. It's that people think this platform might end up being huge, and and the value is is based on that. And and I, I mean, that's that's true of them. It's true of everyone else. I wouldn't I wouldn't just call them out. I think Steemit is pretty interesting though. Is maybe like the only cryptocurrency driven app that really exists <coughs> in the world and is working. I'm right here. We have one. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's okay. I mean, yeah. what, what are you guys working on? Library. Oh, okay, yeah, library's out there too. I mean, I guess you could say Saya is like people are using Saya, but there's there's really not a lot of them. So, yeah. I mean, they, yeah, no, I agree. That's what that's part of what gets that's part of what uh, confuses me, right? Is there seems to be so much excitement and there's so much money, and it's like, well, where is it? Why can't I touch it? Why can't I interact with it? Why can't I start using it? Right, right. And I think, I mean, if you guys, I don't know if any of you guys are Steemit users, but I think like the monetization has brought a lot of perverse incentives to Steemit. Like Steemit's cool, but I think it's strictly speaking way, way worse than Reddit. Like Reddit's just a better version of Steemit in most ways. Aren't you an investor? <laughs> We're investors in Steemit. And, and, and I think, and I think, so, so that's not, that's not a dig at Steemit necessarily. So that's like, right now, centralized platforms are going to be better. And the, the challenge for decentralized platforms is what they're good at is, is hardcore censorship resistance. And so if you can leverage that to make your platform, you know, maybe UX parity with the centralized thing, but then also, you know, monetizable and censorship resistant, that's when you have something pretty magical. And I think Steemit's on their way there. You must be the most honest venture capital investor I've ever met. <laughs> Goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's growth mindset investing, right? It's the same reason why people invest in Amazon. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Amazon and Steemit should at all be used in parallel in any sentence ever. But I do think that there, it's unfair to try and characterize it as, you know, well, present day user base is X and the valuation is Y. Um, I do think that, you know, there needs to be, I, I, I say this all the time, in cryptocurrency right now, a lot of the builders and a lot of the investors are in an optimization mindset. And so I even earlier referred to, oh, I'm really excited about these things that are supposed to be better versions of Ethereum. Well, okay, let's go back to first principles though and figure out what Ethereum is actually good for before we try and go on and build a better version of it. And I think that, you know, as Eric was just alluding to, that's an issue with Steemit right now, perhaps, where they built this sort of social engagement platform. But maybe all it's good for is the censorship resistant version of that. And, you know, where is there actually demand for that? And that's where it does become really important, I think, for protocols to think about product market fit or protocol market fit, even if they're not going to go out and monetize it themselves. I think it's really interesting you bring up those numbers, actually, because um, you can kind of just do the numbers in your head for Facebook or for uh, Snapchat, right? And just having briefly done that with the, the numbers I don't really have right now, I, I think the multiple is probably way, way bigger for Steam, right? Exactly. Yeah, so um, it, it's, it's a really interesting comparison, right? Um, but I, th I think it, maybe it doesn't quite work because, you know, um, you're, you're, you're comparing something which is the aggregate value of these tokens to, you know, like a traditional equity market cap. And those comparisons kind of fall apart a lot of times. I'm really just trying to be provocative. I'm not <laughs> suggesting it's a, it's a fair comparison. Um, uh, no, it's an interesting point, though. Um, and Steam is one of the sort of few projects that like does function, right? Um, and like people use. Um, and uh, how low is our benchmark? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's really important to be honest about this stuff because I think like, I mean, first of all, as investors, you have to be honest with yourself about this stuff. 
Um, but also for, for the outside world, like if, if we're just seen as hyping these things that don't work yet, that's a really bad place to be. Um, and I think we should own the fact that like most of this stuff sucks right now. Like Bitcoin kind of sucks, like it all, it all kind of sucks. But like the fact that it works at all is like incredibly exciting and, and nothing like this has ever existed before. And so you just have to like embrace the suck. <laughs> Into it. Yeah, just like lean into the suck, and it's, it's just gonna keep getting better. Um, and and what I think is, I guess all of us probably find pretty inspiring about a lot of these projects is like the people that are actually contributing code to these do not care about the prize very much. I think that's especially true of the Bitcoin team, but I've seen that of a lot of other teams too, where it's like they these people are not looking at the price; they don't care where the price goes. They're just gonna keep cranking on these things no matter what. And so that that creates like an incredibly resilient community. And Bitcoin could drop to a hundred bucks for a couple of years, and like most of the Bitcoin core devs I know would just keep writing code. And it would just keep getting better. Yeah, and I, I think that's the right attitude. Um, not to, and I realize I'm a modern moderator, not a panelist, but the, the the price moves are completely orthogonal to the actual key metrics that you care about as growing a company, right? Like I could line up the price moves in our token with various things that have happened in terms of users or content being on the network and so on, and it's like there's no alignment whatsoever. It's uh, they're 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 not correlated. Uh, the ways the price moves does not seem to react to. You know, real world changes or real world success of the platform. Yeah, it's just about when you get listed on Binance. <laughs> um, uh, so, all right. Well, I'll just keep uh, I'll just keep asking questions. Although, if people do want to line up at the mics, I'll I'll call on you. Uh, so, one of the things uh, that that uh, came up earlier was this idea of of. Am I out? I'm out of time. I was looking for the guy with the seconds, and I didn't. Oh, see him, sorry, so. that was okay. supposed to be me, but uh, <laughs> I got to call attention. Um, Well, thank you guys. Thank you for the great panel. Really appreciate it.